a uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and a warm welcome on behalf of you chambers thank you for joining in today on our first webinar of the year uh, today we have experts with us who will discuss the implementation of uh, ai and advanced analytics for consumer goods and manufacturing industry before we begin let me introduce you to dr joseph shields the co-chairman of ict committee of the chamber dr Dr. Joseph Shield is an experienced corporate leader with demonstrated success in driving uh, growth and operational excellence in existing businesses and building businesses for the future by predicting business tre trends, building future competencies along, along with value chain and driving digital transformation. So I would request you to kindly welcome the guest. Thanks, Anvita. And, uh... A warm welcome and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, you know, launch this webinar, the first webinar of this year um, on the topic, as Anvita mentioned, it's, it's on AI and advanced analytics for the consumer goods and manufacturing industry. And uh, this webinar is being, uh, um, you know, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Durjoy Pratranavish and uh, Sriram Krishnamurti from Tiger Analytics. Um, just wanted to kind of give you a brief about the uh, chambers itself, like for those of you who uh, are attending a webinar like this for the first time. So we are called as the Council of the EU Chambers of Commerce in India and more popularly as the EU Chambers. And um, one of the objectives that we have and the foremost objective is to actually be a trade promotion organization. Um, and we uh, have been started in uh, 1992 um, and we've been promoting, fostering, and extending commercial and economic and cultural relations between India and EU. Uh, the promoters of the chambers are the European Binational Chambers and the European Binational Business Committees. And the chief patron for our chambers is the ambassador and the head of delegation of the European Union to India. Uh, our membership includes uh, various representatives from industry sectors, such as uh, the BFSI sector, infrastructure, automobiles, and pharma, you name it. We have uh, you know, representation from pretty much every sector that has got a presence in uh, EU and uh, India from a trade perspective. Uh, we play a very pivotal role in assisting our member companies uh, to promote trade relations between uh, both of these geographies and also to provide a platform for our members to carry out business activities. In addition to this, uh, we also um, have functional and advisory support committees for various sectors. And uh, the ICT is one of the sectors where we have uh, such a sector committee. And these committees um, uh, basically seek to establish a strong business relationship um, from a trade and partnership and a technology exchange and joint venture and greenfield investment perspective. Um, this uh, past year, that is 2020, has been a pandemic year, and um, it's been a year that we have, uh, from various committees and from the chambers, strived our best to um, keep our members abreast with the latest trends, latest happenings from a business and a technology perspective. And this effort to have this webinar is one such effort, and we all know the importance of AI and analytics um, in various industry sectors. And specifically, we're going to look at the consumer goods and the manufacturing industry. First of many such webinars to come. So keep looking for announcements from um, the chambers. We're going to have a lot of other stuff coming on blockchain, on trade finance, and uh, uh, industry 4.0, and many more to come. And I'm sure uh, you're going to have a very exciting time today uh, hearing from Durjoy and Sriram um, on their perspective on how uh, the artificial intelligence and analytics uh, are disrupting various industries and more particularly the consumer goods and manufacturing industry. So Dujoy and uh, Sriram, uh, welcome to this uh, panel today and we look forward to hearing from you guys and participants just have uh, a, a good enlightening experience. All the very best. Thanks, thanks, thanks Dr. Joseph. Uh, so. Uh... Uh, once again, you know, good afternoon, everyone. This is Durjoy here. Uh, let me quickly uh, switch uh, my screen. Um, 
So let me know if you are able to. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, Anvita, are you going to present that or do I take over? Let me just quickly, sir, introduce you to our sure, participants. Sure, sure. And then you can take over the screen. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have with us uh, Mr. Joe Joy. He's the head of Global Business Tiger Analytics, a proven business and sales leader with more than 23 years of uh, in diverse uh, science, especially in data science and analytics, tech and process outsourcing services with significant exposure to banking, finance services, and retail and tech industry. We also have with us Mr. Sriram Krishnamurthy. He is the vice president of data science, Tiger Analytics. He is a seasoned advanced analytic executive with deep expertise in designing and implementing advanced analytic solutions across a wide range of business area and industry. A warm welcome to both of you, sir. And uh, Mr. Dojoy, now over to you. Thanks, thanks, Anvita. So hopefully, uh, you know, uh, you all are able to see my screen. Yes, we can, sir. Okay, perfect. So uh, again, uh, thank, thanks everyone for joining this webinar. Uh, what we plan to do in today's uh, webinar is primarily uh, uh, start with a kind of a context setting in terms of where is AI and advanced analytics moving, what's been the journey so far, where are the areas that it is becoming more prominent, and specifically in the consumer goods and manufacturing industry, what are the different types of solutions that are being, uh, you know, being used by different, uh, you know, organizations. But more importantly, what are the key drivers of AI advanced analytics becoming that much more prominent across industry? And then subsequently, you know, we will cover, you know, two or three use cases, case studies, a sample set of case studies that we have done for consumer goods and manufacturing industry uh, over the last few years that we have been working with these industry organizations, uh, you know, at Tiger Analytics. With that, you know, primarily uh, in terms of, you know, uh, just to set the context, what does AI mean? Basically, it can be broken into two broad pieces, which is one is general intelligence and second is the narrow intelligence. General intelligence, you're primarily trying to replicate what a human being does under different you know, conditions, different constraints, different you know, uh, environmental setup. Uh, so far, that's probably the, you know, in some sense, the you know, end game that a lot of us you know, are talking about, whether it will be good or bad, that's something which is debatable. But, uh, you know, narrow intelligence is basically trying to replicate human behavior in a specific, uh, I would say, function, specific area, specific, you know, situation. And that's where we, I think uh, the, we have made a significant progress, whether it is with respect to, say, taking marketing decisions, taking manufacturing decisions, taking supply chain decisions. And that's where narrow intelligence comes into play. And there have been you know, variety of progress uh, you know, ha that has happened either to uh, the use of products or use of custom bespoke solution that you know, organizations have built for themselves. Now in the product space, there are multiple players there. Similarly on the services and solution space, there are multiple players there. But what is more interest, in, in, uh, you know, just a, you know, just a kind of you know, uh, tidbits here, you know, according to Gartner, 15% of all customer interaction will be handled by chatbots, uh, you know, in, in, in probably one or two years time frame, probably in, by end of 2021, beginning of 2022. That's kind of tells the, the speed at which, you know, AI is becoming that much more real for all of us. Uh, in terms of, you know, how does it actually happen? Again, you know, uh, the, the data is or information that we, uh, as a human being, we cover a capture is coming from different sources. And similarly, any AI and advanced analytics ecosystem captures this data across, you know, connected devices, e-commerce websites, uh, customer database, social media. Uh, but uh, I think in order to make it AI enabled or advanced analytics enabled, you need to build a data layer first, data foundation layer first. And that's there, are, you know, various uh, flavors of that, uh, you know, traditionally it used to be data warehouse, now it has become more cloud and data lake uh, driven. Uh, but then the, the, then the piece around AI and advanced analytics comes into play. Now, traditionally, you know, three, four years back, it was more utilization of structured data. 
but uh, lately in last three to five years time we have seen a lot of utilization of image data visual data uh, you know video data audio data that is coming to play iot and sensor data is becoming huge uh, so use of machine learning and deep learning is becoming that much more you know i would say uh, you know topical uh, in in current world and that's where i think the whole ai uh, ecosystem is becoming evolving and becoming more mature yeah uh, the more important thing is once you build a solution how do you actually make uh, uh, primarily get the outcome of that solution so and therefore deployment and building mobile apps and web app is becoming that much more important so it's not the journey of building the smartest ai solution but more importantly how do you actually connect that ai solution to the end user that is you know probably you know uh, very very important because otherwise the whole uh, you know adoption of ai will not be you know as anticipated yeah uh, this has been the overall journey in terms of maturity of how analytics has evolved over a period of time obviously in late 90s it was primarily all about building you know uh, dashboards building you know uh, you know sql dashboards ad hoc reports query drill downs but over the last i would say you know uh, last 5 6 years where we see much more in terms of building optimization solution building stochastic optimization solution building you know uh, i would say uh, you know iot sensor based solution building uh, you know RT, uh, you know building the advanced analytics solution that has become much more prominent you know for quite some time we were you know pretty much working on the statistical analysis forecasting predictive modeling almost almost a period of 10 years between you know 2005 2015 that was fairly prominent but since 2015 i think uh, uh, ai in true sense has kind of you know uh, leap forward it uh, in our day to day you know solutions that we build for our clients uh, this is a kind of a snapshot of how industry has adopted advanced analytics and AI. So if you look at, you know, obviously there are, you know, snapshots of other industry, but if you look at CPG and retail, as well as automotive and manufacturing, you know, these, uh, you know, tick marks just shows that, you know, how much AI and advanced analytics has penetrated these two industry. You know, probably five years back, the number of tick marks would be low. Probably 10 years back, there will be probably hardly one or two areas where, you know, automotive manufacturing industry have embarked on. So that shows the maturity with which, you know, now the whole AI and advanced analytics is percolating down to industries, you know, across industries in that sense. Now, one of the other things that we see uh, that is uh, driving, uh, you know, adoption of AI and advanced analytics in automotive and manufacturing industry is the whole industry 4.0 and IoT, uh, uh, you know, uh, itself. So that's pretty much been in some sense, chicken and egg. So uh, IoT as well as Industry 4.0 cannot survive without you know AI and analytics and vice versa. Yeah. Now, what are the factors leading to prominence of AI and advanced analytics? Some you know some bullet points according to us. Uh, I, I think uh, what the industry have always realized uh, that analytics is generating significant ROI. So typically, we can expect anywhere between 10 times to 100 times ROI, if not more, with use of AI and advanced analytics. Uh, obviously, big data is everywhere. Uh, connected devices, e-commerce, mobile apps, all is generating data at an exponential rate for us. And to make a meaning out of that, you, need, you cannot do you know, traditional human-driven analytics, and it has to be done through AI and machine learning and deep learning activities. Uh, as I mentioned, mobile device usage has improved. Therefore, you need to make more sense out of that data. Uh, data storage costs have reduced significantly. That is enabling, you know, much more cost-effective, cost-efficient solutions. Uh, the overall affordability of doing analytics with the help of products and tools and, you know, variety of service provider has made it much more, you know, democratized in some sense. And we always talk, we talked about e-commerce and mobile economy companies have you know kind of you know mushroomed over the last five to seven years and that's probably also driving ai and advanced analytics in our day-to-day -day lives uh they, however there are certain concerns uh you know most of the business are still not ready to adapt they are probably still struggling what is the roadmap ahead 
how do they adapt to new technologies, new solutions. Um, they still see the data, you know, uh, the whole big data environment as chaotic. So there's always a debate whether to buy versus build, whether to go for product, whether to go for custom bespoke solution. I think that's still something which is up for debate uh, in, in the minds of the buyers. Uh, and also what is happening is the, you know, uh, BI and traditional data analytics also has created a confusion about what is advanced analytics, underutilization of information. Uh, only I think 31% of organizations are able to adapt, you know, valuable insights of the existing data. So they are trying to question the fact that whether do we need to invest more where we are already underutilizing our information that we can do using BI and other traditional, you know, analytics solutions. Uh, on the other side, there's also a very big uh, concern about data privacy, uh, data security. Uh, again, a variety, various stages of maturity across geography, whereas US market are probably already adapted to this. Uh, I think uh, lesser uh, mature market are still, you know, debating on, you know, what kind of data privacy, uh, you know, infrastructure that we need to build what kind of policies we need to build. So that's again an area of concern for some of the you know, organizations. Now, another thing is data has mushroomed in some of these organizations over a period of time because we have built new business models, new applications, new infrastructure. So therefore data are not joined up together. So data are in silos. And once you use only silo data that probably doesn't give you a complete insight about your business. So therefore, the organizations are thinking about whether to integrate the data first or whether to start generating insight from the siloed data. So that's again a point of debate among a lot of organizations that we work with. And finally, in terms of you know uh, the talent pool, uh, that's obviously in short supply. Uh, uh, again, AI and data science is a uh, is something new. People are obviously trying to get trained themselves, but also the fact that the quality of talent that is out there in the market may not be appropriate to build a you know, robust AI solution. So uh, again, therefore there's a lot of buzz about it, but to find the right talent um, is always difficult, whether for a service provider like us or for, for an organization which is trying to build its own AI and advanced analytics team. Uh, in terms of major trends, I think what we are seeing in the AI and advanced analytics industry is I think uh, people are trying to uh, move from piloting to operationalization and deliver, de uh, you know, generating business outcome. Uh, there's definite uh, movement uh, happening in terms of moving away, not away, moving actually expanding the scope of AI and advanced analytics solution beyond structured data. So a lot of effort is going around use of non-structured data, which can be in the text or you know, uh, audio or uh, you know, image or video form. Uh, obviously, cloud is gaining popularity because of which, you know, a lot of our clients are saying that now we can do build AI solution and deploy it because cloud infrastructure allows me to do that. Otherwise, I have to, you know, really, really think uh, hard before building the whole infrastructure in-house on on-prem. Uh, dashboards, obviously, the utility of dashboards are declining. Uh, and again, it is becoming much more, I would say, cognitive. So we, for example, we have built, you know, text search base, voice base, NLP based, you know, self-service reporting platforms, which is driving the, you know, less consumption of dashboards. So typically what has happened in the past is you'll have hundreds of reports and, you know, probably lots of dashboards. Only probably, you know, five to 10% of those reports or dashboards were utilized. Remaining 90% were pretty much ad hoc reports that were generated. And it created a plethora of, you know, reports and reports which were hardly used. So therefore the focus is to do less and get more. And that's why you will see less discussion about building you know, one more dashboard and more focus on actually how do I derive more value out of existing ecosystem of dashboards. Uh, obviously continuous analytics is primarily, you know, uh, life is pretty much real time. Uh, that too primarily with the advent of e-commerce, mobile devices, mobile commerce coming into play. So there's a lot of focus on taking real-time decisioning and therefore continuous analytics is becoming the new norm rather than just building uh, an analytics solution which is primarily based historical data and trying to predict the behavior or some, something. 
it is now becoming as real as possible to so almost near real time or real time you know decisioning is becoming the norm and that's something that will probably gain more traction in in days to come uh, as i mentioned data security is important and therefore focus on data security is rising each country uh, through its own laws and regulations is becoming much more protective about its own you know um, uh, uh, consumer data so therefore it is becoming again uh, in some sense segregated so therefore the focus on data security is on the rise data marketplaces and exchanges right so one thing is that you can own your own data you can actually source your data from external sources to make uh, set out of ai and advanced analytics solutions so i think there are a lot of marketplaces that are going to come up which will source data for you with, to enable your advanced analytics you know uh, you know uh, organization or advanced analytics solutions and at the end of the day data analytics world are colliding what we see is uh, uh, till some years back you know data engineering and data science was different uh, you know uh, uh, you know business entities or organization but we see that you know more and more data scientists are actually doing ml ops and ml engineering work and data engineering are also started doing ml ops and ml engineering work so we are seeing that there's some amount of you know uh, cohesion that is happening between both the data world and the advanced analytics world so that's a kind of you know set of major trends that we observe in terms of you know key transformation that we are seeing over the last few years is you know people are moving from whether to do a building of in house to getting services from external data sources so it's a kind of a the answer is not uh, either or it's primarily somewhere in between uh, comprehensive analytics whether do we go to large organizations and get them to do everything under the sun in terms of the overall analytics uh you know ecosystem or to reach out to niche players and get the specialized offerings and special specialized service from them uh emerging verticals what we see is traditionally bfsi retail telecom where the early i think uh, adapters of advanced analytics and ai but now we see manufacturing healthcare education becoming really really uh, strong advocates of advanced analytics and ai what are companies doing i think they are trying to acquire advanced analytics and ai capabilities they are either trying to do it organically or inorganically uh, some of them are apply, acquiring smaller companies some of them are actually building it themselves but what we see is big data iot advanced analytics automation these are the most sought after functions that they will acquire any company for if they see that there is a definitive edge in any organization who, who have these service lines or these offerings they are more likely to be acquired by a customer rather than by an organization rather than having a full suite of you know service offerings that they may have so that's pretty much you know what's happening with the industry as such uh, coming to consumer industry and manufacturing industry uh, these are you know the sample set of solution that we have built at tiger for some of our clients whether it is in the r and d side whether it's in the finance and sales and operations side on the manufacturing side we have done tons of work and predictive maintenance anomaly detection environment health and safety and compliance iot analytics in the supply chain side we have done forecasting out of stock on shelf availability supplier carrier performance analytics on the hr side again primarily around the you know uh, team optimization team scheduling all of that uh, similarly on the sales and marketing analytics side from the marketing standpoint we have done lots of work in the emerging trends and business so people want to know what are the new trends what are the new product ideas that i should be focusing on that can help me in prioritization of my r and d efforts similarly you know consumer promo optimization in the sales and strategic revenue management side route to market trade promotion optimization pricing analytics and direct to consumer primarily where it you have a e-commerce or a direct to consumer uh, channel how do you actually manage your consumers directly uh, so there these are the you know broad landscape of what is being done for consumer industry and manufacturing industry with that i will uh, you know any uh, we probably you know hold on to your questions we will have a separate q and a session at the end of this session i'll pass it on to shriram to go through some of the you know to three use cases specifically in the consumer industry and manufacturing industry shriram hey hey th thanks ajay um, hello everyone um, like durjoy mentioned um, what we have done is actually 
um, you know, put together uh, two, three different uh, types of AI advanced analytics work that we have done in CPG and manufacturing industries to just showcase the breadth of what is possible with AI. Right? The first um, problem statement, which where we helped a very large um, pet food company um, was to uh, use AI to help understand what are some of the emerging trends in, in pet food category. Right? Uh, what are certain claims, ingredients uh, uh, that, that are emerging in various sources. Like we, we have a deluge of data sources from social to search to e-commerce to product reviews to new product launches across the globe. So what can we glean from all of that so that it helps fuel our R&D and product development uh, over the next three to five years. And that's all being driven by an AI engine that, that kind of helps us not only pull the data together, but also uh, identify what are the trends and, and you know, how do you extrapolate these trends uh, to figure out what could be the market opportunity over the course of several years. And then we've been able to identify approximately about the $3 billion of incremental uh, opportunity over the course of five years or so. Yep. So that's, that's one uh, use case we'll look at. Uh, and the other use case uh, is, is on the direct to consumer side where e-commerce is increasingly an important channel. It's the fastest growing channel for, for most CPG uh, organizations. And uh, you know, we want to understand hey, how does uh, consumer behavior respond to price changes? What happens when, when we change prices? There are so many moving parts here. We change our prices, the price changes by the competitors. Uh, we introduce new products. Uh, there could be cannibalization, incrementality. How does all of these factors come together? And how can I understand what happens to consumer behavior? So we can optimize our pricing strategy uh, in, in the e-commerce channel. And uh, here we've done this across uh, clients, uh, but this particular example, we're able to identify short-term opportunity for about three to $4 million. Right? So those are two CPG AI examples. Uh, uh, a manufacturing example, um, again, that, that we do a lot of work in is in predictive maintenance, um, uh, wherein we have helped uh, uh, come up with early warning signals uh, for, hey, what could be potential machine failure, what types of trends basis IoT sensors uh, indicate that there is some sort of an anomaly which requires investigation or a check. And in doing so, uh, you kind of take steps towards reducing downtime. And, and that reduction in downtime uh, potentially delivers a whole bunch of savings um, uh, you know, for, for the manufacturer. And, and we've kind of built out these systems across a whole host of uh, uh, types of equipment, types of machinery uh, for, for a very leading uh, manufacturer. Uh, Dujai, if you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, just coming to the first use case, right? uh, identifying emerging trends. Like I said, the key question that's been asked in a lot of CPG companies is, hey, there's just so much going on. There's so many new products coming, new ingredients, new claims. A claim could be this product is a non-GMO, or uh, there could be an ingredient like, for example, Manuka honey, or it, it could be you know apple cider vinegar. Right? There's a whole bunch of newer products, newer combinations of uh, uh, ingredients and claims that keep coming up. So how do we understand uh, where we should focus and what should be our R&D and product strategy uh, so that we open up a significant opportunity over the next three or five years. And uh, there's a lot of data available here. There's data available in social media. There's a data available from search trends on Google. There's data available um, through reviews uh, of, of products online, through e-commerce channel. Uh, there is data available and things like patents and uh, key opinion leaders in several categories who talk about new products and uh, in their opinion on, on these products. So how can we pull all of this together and, and then be able to parse, say, hey, what are these trends? What are the claims? What are the ingredients uh, which are trending and which can open up a, a big business opportunity? And that's the uh, engine, right? So there's an engine that runs behind, which kind of looks at all of this data, uh, is able to map uh, product information to claims and ingredients, and then uh, also take that information and project out 
hey, what what is the future potential for this over the few years? Um, yeah. So uh, from an illustration standpoint, right? So you you look at uh, the types of data sources. We have point of sale information could be syndicated um, and so on. There's a lot of e-commerce sales information uh, that's available. Search Google. Uh, search as well as product search and e-commerce. There's social listening platforms that give you social data. There is consumer um, uh, reviews on, on e-commerce platforms and so on. Likewise, uh, pay, patterns and, and uh, data about uh, you know newer formulations. Right? Um, then this engine actually takes all of this information. It's able to tag that, tag that to different trends. Uh, uh, essentially identify what are the uh, keywords, we use a lot of uh, NLP approaches, uh, um, and then also figure out, hey, what's the scale and growth of this? And uh, we're really looking at what kind of engagement some of these are getting. Are people talking a lot about certain ingredient? Are people uh, retweeting a lot of uh, uh, tweets that have uh, these ingredients? Or uh, are these reviews with these ingredients generally of positive nature versus negative nature and so on, right? So what, what's the engagement and uh, uh, with, with a lot of these uh, different trends that are observed. Then kind of take this and integrate this with sales information. You also have sales data from syndicated sources on your product launches, your own products, products from competitors. Hey, how does kind of ingredients and claims that are trending, uh, how, how do this uh, relate to the trends that we are observing in uh, sales? And then do this kind of pattern matching, which is really the core of the AI engine. It's pattern matching to figure out, hey, which of these trends are sustainable and which could sort of extrapolate to a large market versus trends which uh, are, are really not taking off, right? And, and where should we focus? Okay. Yeah, go to the next slide. Yeah. Now, from a trend uh, matching perspective, right? So, so uh, there are lots of different sophisticated algorithms, machine learning approaches that actually underpin this, this AI engine. And, and uh, what the engine does is it tries various algorithms of uh, to figure out, hey, where have we seen such trends in the past? Right? Which, which products that have launched, which ingredients that have launched in the past have had similar kind of high growth trend? And how have they extrapolated? How has that market expanded over a period of time? And uh, we use a whole bunch of these uh, algorithms and, and machine learning approaches to figure out for emerging newer claims and trends, uh, what is the future potential? Right? How do I forecast out in the next three to five years what's likely to happen? They kind of also provide bounds around hey, what's what's the likely range of, of uh, opportunity that uh, you could potentially get from some of these. Right? So, and all of these pieces, again, it's, it's continuous learning, right? So, so there is the sources, you, information gets ingested, uh, there is uh, identification of engagement and trends, and then there are these uh, uh, sophisticated pattern matching and forecasting algorithms that uh, project out what's what's likely to happen in the future. And as newer things emerge, as newer claims are emerging, this engine sort of keeps uh, uh, producing hey, what are the opportunity areas uh, for, for an organization to focus on. So that's that's one example of where AI is actually helping in product development and uh, um, you know, R&D efforts in, in, in a CPG context. Okay, we, we can move to the next slide. Okay, so um, just from an illustration standpoint, right? So what, what you see here is, Hey, we are looking at uh, from a pet food standpoint. This is a dry cat, and there are certain claims. We have masked the data, and uh, not only understand what's the opportunity, but also understand where is it emerging. Is it emerging in Facebook, on Twitter, on, on Google Trends? If so, how is it emerging? Are there newer products getting launched? And what's the shape of the curve? Right? What what's going to be next twelve months versus next uh, uh, thirty six months? Uh, and what kind of volume shares you have versus what competitors have in this particular claim or, or ingredient. So kind of overlay all of that internal information along with what we have gleaned from external sources, along with these uh, uh, forecasting algorithms, all of that is brought together in a fairly easy to use interface uh, where business users can actually go in, uh, understand what's happening and also use this information to 
uh, decide where, where they would want to focus. Okay. Okay. So just coming to the next use case, which is uh, uh, again in the CPG uh, industry, but focused a bit more on the e-commerce pricing side. So, so um, as, as all of us uh, would know here, right, e-commerce is uh, continually sort of expanding in its overall share of channel. Uh, and uh, CPG uh, organizations need to get a handle of, hey, what's, what's working versus not working from a pricing promotion standpoint. Uh, in the e-commerce channel, right? So how do I optimize my promotions? Should I really be running all these promotions? You know, am I really getting incrementality from the promotion or is it really just cannibalizing um, uh, volumes from my other products and other brands, right? So, so how do we understand? Again, doing so at scale in, in a way that, that it is uh, um, not like a traditional way of modeling each category, each um, you know, brand separately, like how can an engine sort of an AI approach uh, allow us to do so uh, at scale. Okay. So uh, again, a lot of things affect sales, uh, as you would all know. Uh, there's going to be pricing, uh, promotions uh, th that are being offered, promotions offered by the manufacturer versus their co competitors. There's going to be a whole bunch of seasonality with a lot of products, uh, uh, clearly inventory metrics, uh, and then there are going to be in, in the e-commerce special things around Amazon events, right? If, if you're uh, selling on Amazon, they would have their own, you know, large uh, promotional events and days like the prime day. And there could be other days in, in this is for us. So they will have Thanksgiving and then Christmas. Uh, and then the last thing is also there's a bunch, lot of category trend, right? So the certain categories, certain products, uh, certain brands are just trending over time, uh, uh, whether it's trending up or down and how do you account for that? To really understand what's happening with our strategy of, of promoting and, and then how do we optimize this uh, to, to maximize the uh, financial um, impact for, for our business. Okay, so this is a, um, you know, just a, maybe a one click down on what's actually beneath in, in, in that AI engine. Um, right? So uh, what you actually do is you look at a lot of this data, look at the e-commerce sales data, um, and then uh, try to figure out, hey, what's the right uh, level at which you build these models? Right? Should, should we look at a, a particular product item? Do you look at a, a product category? And, and then where do you build the models? Uh, so there's a lot of uh, uh, sophisticated uh, data processing as well as uh, uh, what is called as feature engineering, right? In, in terms of figuring out, hey, what are the drivers of, of sales? Uh, and, and kind of building out those models uh, uh, that's happening underneath and a whole range of uh, different machine learning techniques are applied. And typically it's an ensemble of these or potentially kind of uh, the best of these uh, that get selected uh, because they perform the best on, on the data, they give you the best possible predictions. And there's a lot of evaluation of, of this output from not only a technical standpoint, right? How could they, they fit uh, historical data, but also does it make sense, right? From a consumer response standpoint, uh, are these the kind of uh, responses that uh, we expect? Uh, and, and kind of then it's uh, productionized in, in terms of, hey, like the data comes in, these models and features get gener uh, generated, and then you have outputs uh, that kind of tell you, hey, what's the, sensitivity to promotions uh, in, in, in terms of sales sensitivity to promotions and also how do we optimize uh, promotions to get the maximum uh, impact uh, of, of each one of those yeah uh, could, could you make me yeah and uh, likewise in all of these kind of engine systems that that you build out nowadays with these ai systems uh, eventual um, output is, is something business can consume in, in a fairly seamless manner right it's just like one more, uh, either a web application or a you know, mobile app in, in some cases where you can, a business user can actually log in and get a sense for their brands, their category, what's happening with all the promotional spending that they're doing, right? Uh, how much of it is actually um, yielding incremental dollars versus things which are essentially cannibalizing, right? You're just shifting sales from one brand to another or one set of SKUs to another set of SKUs what's working, not working, and what's really the true ROI. 
and using this information then the business can go back and figure out hey which are the promotions that are not working they should probably not run them which are the promotions that are really driving incremental sales how do i double down on that and, and figure out uh, is this the right uh, way or most effective way to do it or are there other uh, kind of expansion possibility with, with these promotions right so all of this is again delivered through uh, fairly simple easy to use apps uh, uh which which most people are familiar in their day to day lives but even a lot of the business applications the ai applications uh the output is actually through these apps okay and and lastly you know this is more at a much higher level summary which which management could potentially look at to understand overall what is my promotions actually giving them right uh, you know in, in this particular example you'll see about 30 or a third of the sales are cannibalized so so if you see um you know promotion kind of delivering certain x million dollars of impact uh, a third of it is cannibalized two thirds of it is incremental so that understanding really helps in in figuring out hey how do we plan for next year what should we be doing which of these promotions we don't run which to be run and uh, what's the true incremental value that i'm getting from my promotions uh and and you know there's various slices and dices of this information that's possible uh but but the core is really that uh, machine learning engine which which allows um, businesses to look across so many factors and then be able to glean what's actually driving sales and now how much is promotions contributing to that okay um so i'll come to the last uh, use case and this is uh, slightly shifting gears uh, on the manufacturing side um so we do a lot of work in the predictive maintenance space and and uh, uh one kind of use case of of ai that uh, we see quite repeatedly is is uh, in the area of uh, equipment failure and anomaly detection related to equipment failure right so in in most of the manufacturing uh, setups uh, there are these equipments that are running uh, for for various processes uh, and uh, a lot of them have sensors that are attached sensors that could be measuring temperature it could be accelerometer accelerometer measuring uh, the xyz Uh, coordinates it could be pressure vibration whole bunch of readings uh, uh, that are being generated from these uh, iot sensors and um, typically if uh, without ai a way to do all this is uh, you know manually look at the output the data that's been generated build some models do some analysis and try to find some patterns some where there is a failure versus what was sensor readings uh, and come up with A, a way to do this, uh, which is very labor intensive as well as manual, and it's it's not fast enough, right? That's the traditional way of building these uh, models and systems. Um, so what we have helped uh, some of our clients to actually do is uh, kind of take this and and build it out uh, as again as an engine, which can uh, not only process all this information, work with some data inadequacies, data challenges, impute. uh missing information but also run through various algorithms approaches in, in an automated way and pick which is the best and uh, deploy them so that uh, the business gets a continuous view of hey what's happening with my equipment and if there is an anomaly or or a, a certain deviation from what's expected uh you actually get an alert right uh, through, through again a simple easy to use app uh which then somebody who is uh, managing or inspecting these equipments can go and maintain and take a look at it and and net net uh the end goal is to reduce uh, sort of the downtime right you don't want these equipments to be inspected and brought down uh when when there's nothing wrong right so so how how do you kind of uh have a maintenance protocol uh, which reduces downtime and and kind of keeps up time uh, higher right? uh, can we go to next slide okay yeah so in in this uh, particular example these are different uh, uh, types of equipment we built this for this is in in a blast furnace area uh, so we have all kinds of uh, uh, equipment here crushers fans uh, um, you know de dusting fan process fan uh, transformer and and a whole bunch right and each of these have different sensors uh, and they all sort of have slightly different readings and and the way the output comes and what is considered Uh, expected reading versus uh, what is considered a normalus reading uh, and this uh, engine that, that we built out actually takes care of uh, 
uh, all of these different types of equipment and sensors uh, that are attached to them. Okay, so uh, just a quick view on on the analytic approach, right? So, like I said, uh, these sensors uh, record a whole lot of things. They could be recording vibration, pressure, RPM, temperature, whole whole lot of things are uh, constantly being recorded, and and uh, you know the data is uh, getting generated. Uh, this data then gets processed through what what is in the analysis approach is really our anomaly detection, the AI engine, uh, which kind of processes all of this information then it's able to then model out right uh, uh, whether or not a particular um, series or, or sequence of, of readings uh, is, is uh, normal or not normal for that equipment yeah and there are a whole bunch of again sophisticated uh, uh, machine learning and um, uh, you know even deep learning algorithms that are running in the background and, and basis uh, the various algorithms that are running you eventually flag whether or not a particular equipment the sensor readings uh, look like anomalous, right? And, and if they look like anomalous, uh, we build out uh, um, uh, an application which will alert someone as to a potential issue with, with the equipment and they can go ahead and, and inspect that. And these are real time alerts that keep getting generated. Uh, so there is a continuous monitoring of, of equipment health, system health, uh, an alerting feature for, for anomalous behavior. And also kind of not only give what's happening now, but potentially forecast out day what's likely to happen in the next 24, 48, 72 hours, uh, right? So uh, if, if there is something, you know, the trend looks like it's deteriorating, uh, then early action could be taken. So you kind of pre prevent expensive maintenance or repair uh, in, in the future, right? So, so all of this is uh, kind of driven by this engine. Um, uh, that's been set up uh, and, and kind of continually sort of feeds this uh, output to these uh, uh, web applications that have been built up. Uh, Tujak, you can go to the last uh, slide, please. Yeah, so it's just a snapshot um, of uh, what we have done. So, you know, this for this one client in, in this blast furnace uh, uh, area for all the equipment they had, I think approximately about a $2 million savings is, is what uh, uh, we could. Uh, uh, you know, contribute to through developing of a system like this uh, basis, you know, what, whatever they were doing earlier compared to what they are doing now. And also allows them to have a better control of uh, uh, these systems. Uh, they are built for their need, their sensor, their equipment, as opposed to using some external IP or external solution. Uh, so this is kind of custom built for them. Uh, and as you'll see down below, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, different, uh, dashboard views uh, that users can uh, look at. Right? So, so you could look at equipment reliability, you look at a particular plant and equipment and actually see what's what's happening. And uh, if, if there are certain flags that are uh, being indicated, then there's an action that could be taken. Uh, likewise, you could also look at a sensor, right? A particular sensor, how are its readings over time uh, to get a sense for if there is an anomaly, then where is it? And, you know, which sensor actually triggered uh, this red alert in, in, in a particular equipment. So, so all of those views are available uh, to again, business to go and actually intervene and do something about it. Um, and that's what an AI system in, in kind of the predictive maintenance context enables uh, manufacturers to do. So I'll, I'll pause here. Um, and I think uh, uh, if, if there are any questions on, on whatever Durjoy or, or uh, spoke about in terms of overall trends in the business or any of the use cases, uh, uh, we would be happy to answer. Uh, yeah, so we have a question from Mr. Chandramoli Srinivasan. And uh, he's saying that in, case, in your used case experience, how many of your predictions using AI and analytics have actually come true? And he has one more question saying that, uh, do you do a follow-up after a few years to see if your predictions actually came to reality? Um, sure, absolutely, right. So I'll, I'll uh, take answer the question in two parts, uh, right? On, on uh, um, the use cases that where uh, we have very frequent predictions, for example, the uh, predictive maintenance anomaly detection, there we have 
looked at you know what we predict versus uh, uh, what uh, equipment inspector actually comes back and tells us and it's more than 90% of the times our predictions are, are uh, accurate in, in that hey, if you predicted that it's likely to fail they actually inspect and actually notice something is off um, so so those uh, tend to have very clear kind of way to validate uh, not only validation on historically what has happened but also real time validation when somebody can go in and inspect right so that's those types of use cases uh, there's an ongoing validation that that happens and generally it's it's fairly accurate uh, like i said uh, now on use cases which are further out in time for example you know predict out trends for claims ingredients products 3 to 5 years out uh, there we typically look at it more from the perspective of uh, um, look what what's happening in the next 12 months next 24 months uh, uh, and the opportunity sizing that we have done in in various cases uh, what has happened is uh, that uh, organizations or smaller companies that were in those spaces uh, we have seen clients actually acquire them uh, and and do quite well uh, there are certain examples of those in the food category but those are a little bit uh, fewer and farther uh, because of just you know long range forecasts and i'll add to what shina mentioned in terms of you know the near term forecasting typically we uh, you know depending on the obviously business construct typically we see false we restrict the false positives and false negatives as much as possible you know sometime you know basically less than 3% so uh, you know prediction accuracy is typically fairly high but as uh, shira mentioned when we are talking about emerging products emerging themes emerging uh, you know uh, i would say claims which is primarily 3 to 5 years uh, you know uh, in the future that's where the you know whole model or the whole engine needs to be calibrated on a regular basis so that we are able to you know refine on those numbers that we have given to them but it gives a direction at the end of the day client is looking for a direction as to you know there are hundreds of claims or hundreds of themes out of which we which one are the ones we should prioritize so it gives them a prioritization benchmark rather than you know exact numbers obviously gives them a scale of the future but at the end of the day we need to continuously calibrate the solution that we have built for them as the new you know uh, actual numbers keep uh, start coming in Uh, so we have one more question uh, from Mr. Surendra Karla, and he is asking, "What is the hardware and software requirements to implement an A to implement AI in my forging factory?" So uh, let me, you know, take a stab at that. You know, uh, basically, what we need is, you know, very simple. You know, I think we uh, think too much about hardware uh, aspect or the software aspect. what is needed is a uh, right set of sensors which are able to detect all the data elements like vibration temperature uh, current consumption noise all of that and able to populate it there is a mechanism through which those data can be fed real time to some kind of a data store beyond that i think everything is uh, you know relative so Uh, i think the uh, dependency is more on the iot sensor less on the hardware uh, these days you don't need to have own your own hardware you can actually populate this data directly to a cloud infrastructure which is primarily an opex rather than a capex for you and the software typically that we use are typically open source so you can build all the ai and machine learning solution using python and r uh and and you can probably you know probably you already have some bi solution on which these dashboards can be built so i think the focus should be on more on the iot sensor which can report and feed the right kind of data to a, a directed data source or data you know uh, gathering uh, system which can be cloud which can be a is you know simple pc which has enough uh, you know uh, data space Thank you so much, sir. And uh, with this, I guess we come to an end to the Q and A session. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Dojoy and Mr. Shriram, for your expertise that you have shared. Now, moving forward, I would like to introduce Dr. Renu Shom, the director of EU Chamber. 
Uh, she is a doctorate of economics from Jabalpur University and has been associated with the chamber for more than 10 years. Ma'am, may I request you to kindly uh, give the, well, uh, the thank you speech. Thank you, Anvita. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the chamber and my own, I would like to thank Mr. Doja and Mr. Shiram for the excellent presentation and which was very timely, I would say. So as we all agree, this COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated the interconnected nature of our world and that to no one is safe until everyone is safe. So in this trying time, I would say the chamber find its role of a business support for its member companies all the more explicit and pronounced. So it's time to keep its members stay updated with the latest development of what are happening in EU and India. So definitely our strong network is one of our major strength to facilitate, promote and foster the business relation between the two regions. So we have organized many webinars and all this year. Uh, so with the purpose of getting the industry together and sharing the common views with regard to the promoting trade and relation between India and Europe. So I assure you, uh, friends, like as a chamber, we will try our best to organize this kind of event. And what we wanted to do, we wanted to understand from you all as well, you know, what kind of events you would like us to organize, because that is a most important feedback which we are looking from our members, especially the participants. So towards that, what we have done, we have, you will be getting a survey from us after this event or probably you may have got it. Uh, so I would request you please take out the time and just fill it up and which will help the chamber to organize the events. And apart from that also, in case if any of you are interested in meeting or having a call with our esteemed panelists and speakers, you can get in touch with us. We would be happy to provide their contacts and all. So that is from our side. And I would like to thank all of you for your participation and wishing you all the best for this new year. And hopeful, hopefully we'll have a very good year this year. And so with this, I would like to thank each and everyone. So I think we are, we have already, you know, had a, if, if there is no other question answers, then we can like, take it as a, like, you know, concluded. Anvita, if any of the panelists would like to say anything, we would be happy to say. Otherwise, from my side, it's thank you very much. Uh, once again, Mr. Doja and Mr. Shinam, it was really excellent presentation. And we look forward to have a great association with you as well. Thank you, Dr. Shom. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So with this, uh, we shall end the session here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Joseph, for joining us today. Again, I'd like to thank all uh, the panelists. Yeah, thank you.